Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the TNS Lunch and Learn series. Uh, I am Heather, and Craig will also be presenting today. And thank you all for coming and viewing our Lunch and Learn series. Hope you find today's talk useful in your day to day reverse engineering techniques. Tech, um, sorry. Work. <laughs> I was trying to think of something to say, and I totally bombed that. Let's like totally start over. Cut! <laughs> Cut, we are now beginning again. Terry, if you're listening to this, we are starting over. Please delete everything from this point forward, like backwards. Okay. I know, right? <laughs> we sound all kinds, I sound all kinds of fucked up right now. <clears throat> Okay, starting over. Begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Lunch and Learn series. Uh, my name is Heather Eastman, and today also presenting with me is Craig Hefner. Thank you for coming. I hope you find everything presented here useful. Uh, this particular Lunch and Learn series is a, a series which we will recover. We'll cover um, some non-invasive and invasive techniques used in hardware reverse engineering by myself and Craig and a few others. Um, we have divided the series into five different talks. Uh, today we're going to be covering the printed circuit board reverse engineering, followed by a few others. Uh, and these ser the series will be happening every two weeks. Uh, and what we're trying to gauge here is how interested people are in these topics and we will decide whether or not we are going to develop this into a full-blown class. So printed circuit board reverse engineering, uh, all the techniques that we're talking about here today are techniques that are non-invasive. We're not removing anything from the board. Uh, we're not adding anything to the board. Well, the techniques we're talking about are, are non-invasive. Um, also, <clears throat> we are going to talk about some tools that you would use to um, reverse engineer printed circuit boards, uh, and hopefully you can apply the knowledge to your reverse engineering work. Some of the benefits to printed circuit board reverse engineering um, is this is a basic te technique that you would use to begin any type of hardware reverse engineering project. It's your starting point. You are basically trying to figure out what's in the box or what's inside of your <clears throat> how things work on the inside. It's useful when you're trying to find bugs or fix them and using a non-invasive technique is very beneficial when you only have one piece of equipment and also it's basically fun you if you're if you're even interested in figuring out what a particular product does this is this, these are the techniques you would use to figure it out um, the takeaways today for this talk is you'll be able to <clears throat> identify key hardware components be able to tell how those components are connected to each other and how their function, what their functionality is. And at the end of the day, you should be able to produce a schematic of, of whatever it is that you're reverse, reverse engineering. Mm. So what is a printed circuit board? The printed circuit board is basically the skeleton for, for the circuit. Um, it provides, it's basically the backbone. You have this particular board and it you have electrical components connected <clears throat> through copper layers, and um, it provide the the copper provides the electrical connection connections between the components that are placed on the board. So these boards come in several different uh, layers, but the simplest example is a single layer board. And in the single layer board, you're going to find one layer of copper, <clears throat> which is usually going to be 
surrounded by some a substrate. Actually, we don't think we have a substrate in a single layer board, will we? We still have the, you have the FR4, um, and you've got the copper layer on top. Right. And you still have like the silk screen and everything. Well, you right. may have a silk screen. A lot of times, if you have a, only a single layer board, um, you typically only see an older stuff where there's not uh, oftentimes even a silk screen on top. So, right. yeah, single layer boards, you don't see that much. Usually, it's at least a dual layer. <clears throat> okay. So, I kind of forgot there. Um, so usually, right, we might not have a silk screen, but we will have the this, this sol the solder mask, which is the green stuff at the very bottom. You'll have it on the top and on the bottom of the uh, of the board, the of the copper and substrate. Um, <clears throat> you can have a big plane of copper, which is usually going to be the ground plane, but um, the thinner lines are usually the trace, and then you have some pads that are tinned which provide the connection between the components and the copper layer. Now here's an example of a double layer board where you're going to, now in this case, you're going to have some substrate in between two copper layers. And then you will also have a via if you need to con connect the two layers together. There will be a via between the two layers that will go directly through the board, providing connection on the other side. Um, the other thing here that I forgot to mention in the previous slide was the silk screen. You'll have some white lettering on top of the green solder mask, solder mask, sorry. Um, and that's all that we have for this particular slide. And then you can get into some more complicated boards. Oh, I'm sorry. So here <laughs> we have a, um, so what the VIA does essentially is it provides a connection to the other side. So it's essentially a, so it provides one continuous connection between um, a point on the top layer, copper, to the bottom layer. So it's one full uh, uniform connection. Mm. The next type we have is a multi-layer board where there is more than one, one layer or two layer of copper. In this particular example, we see four layers the very top layer is where the uh, surface mount packages are attached. And then we have a second layer and a via going between all four, all four layers, which is here. And we see, it's very hard to see, but if you look closely, there is a small thin piece of copper along the edge of the via, which provides connection to all four layers. So when you first take a look at a circuit board, our printed circuit board, um, what will you see? This is probably what you're going to see when you first, you know, when you open up the package or your electronic package or product. Um, and these are, we're going to go through looking at some stuff here. Uh, here is a ground, well, I believe this is a ground plane. Usually you're going to see, when you see a big plane like this, it's usually ground and it's very light and green color. Um, the rest of it's pretty dark. There's probably nothing underneath it. Um, and a good thing to take a look at too is like the ground, uh, the power traces, which is not ground, but it could possibly be ground. But um, most likely, these are your power traces. The thicker, the thicker traces, which are very um, much thicker than the signal traces, which are the thinner lines here. Um, and then. After that, you have these circles, which the little circles are vias or through holes, but most most likely these are vias that provide the connection to the other side of the printed circuit board. So what gets attached to these uh, printed circuit boards? We have components. They're called components essentially, and they come in passive or s passive or semiconductors. Some of the passive stuff is like resistors, capacitors, and inductors. And then we have our semiconductors, which are transistors, diodes, and integrated circuits. We'll talk about those. Well, actually, we're not going to really talk about those, but we'll cover them and see how you can identify them on the board. Um, if you remember, we were talking about silk screen markings, the, the little white stuff that's white lettering that's on a printed circuit board. 
Um, these are the common designators you're going to find on a printed circuit board. Uh, C is for capacitor, C, D is for diode, uh, J for a connector. Um, going along, you can read this yourself, but U is for integrated circuit. Those are the more common ones you're going to see these days are like the R, C, uh, switch, integrated circuit, and I think was the fuse, right? Yeah, you see fuse oh. and diode and inductor. Yeah. They're the more common ones you're going to see. There's, I mean, there's others that you can look up, but these are the ones you're going to most likely see come across. And here's an example of the designator written on a board. Um, so if we go back, we remember from our previous slide that R was for a resistor. You're going to see, when you see stuff numbered out like R1, R2, R3, it doesn't really mean too much. It doesn't mean that the resistor is like a 1K or 2K or 3K. All it means is it's just the first or second or third resistor listed in a uh, component sheet or when it's the bill, the bills of the bill of materials. Um, doesn't mean really anything. It just means it's a third resistor in, in the bills material. And but. The good thing to, t to note is that an R is a resistor or C is a capacitor, so when you're looking at it, you kind of know what the component is rather than trying to guess. And, oh, and the one component that's actually attached here is actually a diode. And if you see the D1, there's, they actually have attached a diode in it. Um, so what, what do resistors look like? These are, this is what a resistor looks like um, up in the top right you're going to see the schematic symbol and this is what you'll see when you're actually you know writing it out on a piece of paper this is a symbol you would use on a piece of paper for a resistor um, the top left package is a through hole package um, and then you also have a surface mount package which is the bottom left uh, and those on the surface mount packages you're going to find like the resistor value of what type of resistance it is, um, what the value of the resistor is. And if you go further into like researching about resistors, the lines that are on the resistor also can tell you what the value of the resistor is. You just have to, I can't tell you right off right now what it, what it is, but. And so the orange, white, and, and silver. Silver? Yeah. Well, orange yeah. is three, white is nine. Silver is usually a, um, a tolerance code. They've got a, they've got a gold band for the tolerance code. Yeah, the gold band I know is a tolerance code, but the silver I can't tell. So, <laughs> but this is a this is green, red, and brown. It looks like the top left one. Oh yeah, that's yeah. Uh, brown's one, green is five, six. six. So that's a resistor, <laughs> and now we have capacitors. So we have this uh, top left is the surface mount package. This is what you usually see on a board. Um, you'll see these little caps sticking out on top of the board. Um, you also have capacitors that also kind of look. The surface mount packages for capacitors almost look like the resistor. The only difference is it's tan in color, and also does not have any value written on it. You would have to. You can actually measure it, can't you? With capacitance? a multi, yeah. yeah. Uh, you can measure capacitance. Um, a lot of times, whenever you're measuring something, you know, whether it be a resistor, or capacitance, or inductance, or whatever, you usually want to take it out of the circuit unless you really know what there's is. nothing else in the circuit that's going to be affecting that measurement reading. Right. Okay. So, and then how this is drawn in a schematic is basically you know a line with two lines, not touching each other. That's the symbol for a capacitor. For inductors, we have the same symbol, I mean, not the same symbol, but this is a symbol for inductor. Um, there's also another one where it just looks like a little cloud, not necessarily like a spring. Um, so the surface mount package is up here on the left, um, and then the inductor, surf I'm sorry, that was a through hole at the top, and then surface mount package on the bottom left. 
and you can see that they almost look like resistors. The only the big difference between this and the resistor is that the resistor has a value on top of the package and the inductor does not. And there's an inductor on the right on a printed circuit board and it does have an L, which is the designator for an inductor. L15, just the 15th inductor in the, the bill of materials. Next is a diode. There are other schematic symbols that you can use based on you know what type of diode you're actually using, um, like a shock key or a zener, but this is just a very basic symbol. Um, and the thing about diodes is they're polarized, so uh, current can only flow in one direction. And if you take a look at the through package, through hole package, which is at the top left, um, the current will flow from the black to the silver side, but it will not flow from the silver to the black side. Um, you also have surface mount. Here's surface mount packages. Uh, they're very similar. Um, they're, they almost look the same. No, they look the same. I would say they almost look, the surface mount packages can look similar to um, transistor packages, but I think these ones have lettering's on it, doesn't it? Um, they probably do, but they are most likely abbreviated codes. Abbreviated codes. So they're kind of hard to Google for. There are some sites online that will Help. attempt to yeah, reconcile the abbreviated code to the actual part number. Awesome. So if you look really close to on this on this particular, um, I wonder if I can put my mouse on there. Nope. Okay, no mouse. Um, oh, actually I can. There it is. Nice. So this particular package looks really close to what um, you see in the through hole. So this is the band, this silver band here is the direction that current's going to be flowing. And then you have a bunch of diodes over on the right. An example. <gasps> Don't, don't touch the HDMI. Sorry about that. Oh my gosh, what happened? I didn't touch the DM HDMI cable. What happened? You got like an overlay on top of the name. Right, what happened? You just gave out and said, start the presentation. Well, let's just go back and. Well, no, let me still pick up on where you were. Yeah, I'm trying to find where, the, where I was at. There you go. To play it again. And we're back. Sorry about that. Um, so we have diodes and then now we have transistors. Now we have tr uh, the transistor symbol is on the right hand side, right top right. That's what you're going to see in a schematic. Um, and then we have a through hole package followed by a surface mount package. Very close in shape to the diode. Mm -hmm. But um, they're basically in the same package. Yep, they're the same package. And then you'll see over on the right, there's a Q next to that package, so we know that that is a transistor. Next is integrated circuits. So integrated circuits are basically all those components that we saw before packaged up into this really tiny, pretty square package. Um, there's a lot of circuitry going on inside. Uh, we have, and these integrated package, integrated circuit packages come in various types. And here there's a through hole uh, dip package, and then we have a surface mount. This is probably like a, what is that, a TSOP? Or, depending on what type of. Um, well, the two, the two surface mount packages are both um, quad plot packs. Okay. Uh, yes, and then most of these packages will come with some writing. There'll be some, you know, nomenclature on top of it to help you identify what it actually is. Um, so let's take a look at a really simple example of what to expect when you're looking at a uh, printed circuit board for the very first time. You're actually going to need some power. Um, you're probably going to have some sort of controlling uh, integrated circuit that's either a processor and some memory followed by some application specific ICs depending on what type of product you're looking at and what it's trying to accomplish there's going to be some you know uh, components that will help get that accomplished and there's some sort of input and output to um, 
for the user to interact and then you know see the output of the chart in a usable form. Uh, here's a really simple example. Um, let's take a look at this. This is a wireless DSL router. Um, so we can sort of easily like uh, segregate this into sections on what what's trying to be accomplished on this board and we can really we can very simple I mean easily say that this is the power section the red section is the power section simply because there's a switch that turns on this board and then there's the input uh, power so the power adapter um, component at the very top followed by a lot of power power components like a bunch of uh, capacitors and inductors and voltage. I think this one has a voltage regulator too. Yeah, probably. Um, I mean, those, those chips are probably DC to DC converters for the right uh, to step up or step down the voltage for the all the chips. little U twenty U something. Yeah. yeah. And then the next section we can say over here on the right is the green section. We can say is the CPU and the memory because if you look at the packages closely, you're going to see that the big square chip is actually a um, microprocessor, I think it was. And then there's a flash and then some uh, RAM. Next is the Wi Fi section. Uh, when you take a look, a close look at this board, there is an antenna you'll find on it, uh, followed by some uh, a WLAN controller and other few chips that kind of signify that this is probably the Wi Fi section. And Next is the Ethernet. Why do we say this is the Ethernet? It's very simple. If you can't identify an Ethernet switch, you probably should not be in this profession. But it's we have two Ethernet Ethernet ports up there, followed by some stuff that support it. And then this is the DSL section because none of the components on the right hand side are you know supporting the CPU or memory. That is a really simple example. Um, so how were we able to identify that all those components and the sections in that printed circuit board? Well, we took a look at the package markings, and that's the white lettering that's on top of the chips, or it's probably not like in white lettering. You can probably see some really faint grayish color, I guess you can say. But that's when you're going to need some, like a magnifying glass to look at. But you'll find you're going to find like the country code, manufacturing date, lot number, and a product number. Here's a quick example. This is for uh, Marvell. Uh, Marvell puts their product line at the very top, and then their product code is kind of down toward the right hand side. Um, you also will find some additional things like, you know, the lot, lot number, or the date it was assembled, or the country, you know, it was assembled, I guess. Um, but nine times out of 10, which is really odd is that you're going to find the product number to be the number that's under the logo, but yeah, for Marvel it's not. So if we take a look at this next one, um, we have a PIC microcontroller and we, if you take this number and you put it into some, to like Google or something, you'd probably be able to find a data sheet, but um, so if we take it, and we put it into Google or Baidu or a parts vendor, we'll be able to find a data sheet. And if we do that, we will see that there is very, very top one is the data sheet we want to pull out and take a look at. So when we look in the data sheet, we're going to find something like this. Um, there is also a chance that you will find various package types in there for the same controller. Um, the pins may be different, they'll be you know labeled differently and stuff, but you need to look for the the package number that you are you have on the board. So if in our particular example we had the 512L, so we know for sure that this is gonna match up to our package. And the orientation is uh, important when you're looking at a um, at a device on the board and how you can figure out the orientation is by the little divot the little circle at the corner that usually signifies pin one so when you put them not side by side but when you're looking at the package uh, labels inside of your data sheet you want to orient it such that it matches 
um, your package. And um, in this particular example, we're going to put, we're going to, you know, rotate it about 90 degrees to the left. Um, okay, so that's how we look up stuff. Uh, and Craig's going to take over and talk about some common tools. All right. That we use. Um, so when you're dealing with, I get this out of the way. When you're dealing with um, hardware, uh, you can't see things like voltage and current unless stuff catches on fire. Um, so we have to use a couple of tools to help us out. Um, now, for reverse engineering PCBs, a multimeter is really the biggest thing that you want to use. Um, it's going to be the most useful. Um, it's also nice to have some magnification. A lot of the things we'll be looking at you know, might be very small. So um, that's going to help out a lot. And you may need some more advanced tools like an oscilloscope or a spectrum analyzer. We'll talk a little bit about those. But for the most part, uh, a multimeter and your eyeballs are the two biggest things that you need. Um, so you know, as I mentioned, you can have a lot to look at, and some of it might be quite small. So you know, if you're looking at this with no magnification, some of these smaller bits and pieces and traces uh, might not be quite so clear. Um, you stick it under magnification, and you, know, you can kind of follow the traces much more easily and see how things are connected. Um, Multimeters, if you've never used a multimeter before, uh, are quite useful. Uh, what we'll be primarily using is a continuity test. But you can do a lot of different things with multimeters there. As the name suggests, they do many different measurements. Um, but a continuity test is particularly useful because it tells you if two points are directly connected. And uh, it's important to kind of define what directly connected means <laughs> um, because it doesn't necessarily mean that there's nothing there. Um, Basically, in the real world, everything has some resistance. And what the continuity test is doing is measuring resistance. And it says, well, since everything has some resistance, like even a, a copper wire has some resistance. So if, since everything has resistance, the multimeter has to have some threshold where it says, below this resistance, I'll consider these two points directly connected. Above this resistance, I'll, I'll say, well, there, there's something in between here, and they're not directly connected. So if it thinks two points are directly connected, it will make a beeping noise. Um, you also notice in both of these shots it's reading zero on the screen. Uh, it typically will show you uh, the resistance in ohms. In this case, it's seeing zero ohms. Uh, but this might be some non-zero number, right? So it might be 10 ohms and it still beeps and because it says, hey, that's below my threshold. So you just have to be aware of that. Um, one of the things that you may run into is, you know, we talked about vias and things and internal layers that you can't see visually. Well, if you have a connection that goes to a via that goes to, like, disappears into some internal layer you can't see, you have no idea where that connection pops back out. Right? It's going to pop out somewhere on the board, but you don't know where. And it might, you know, run clear over to the other side of the board. It might be somewhere close. You just don't know. So you might need to actually sweep large portions of the board until you get a beep. Right, between the, the point that you know is connected to something interesting and you're trying to find the other point where it pops out. So you can get special brushes for this with uh, little contacts on them, or you can just do the cheap way, take some foil on your finger, um, you know, connect it through a wire to the other end of the multimeter and just kind of sweep across the board till you get a beep. And then you kind of know, oh yeah, that section of the board obviously has um, a via popping out where these two things are connected. Uh, it is important to note when you're doing continuity tests, you want to make sure you turn the device off first because basically what a continuity test is doing is it's inducing a small amount of current through the circuit. And you know if it gets enough of that current, makes it back to the other end of the multimeter, then it says, okay, these two points are connected. Um, so if you already have the device on, there's much larger currents already in the system. You probably won't break anything, but you may get some erroneous readings. So make sure you turn the device off before doing continuity tests. Now sometimes measuring voltage is quite useful as well. This is a simple example. They're just measuring the voltage off of this uh, wall wart uh, adapter here, which is uh, just over 14 volts. So measuring voltage is usually pretty easy. Um, and it can be very useful if you want to look at the voltage on a particular pin. Uh, you might not know what that voltage uh, is in the circuit. So this can be quite useful for, for checking voltages and things like that, obviously. Uh, however, when doing voltage or current readings, uh, you want to make sure the device is on because they need power, right? And voltage and, and current is energy. Energy has to come from the power supply, so you need the device powered on. 
Now, this is very useful if you're looking at a voltage that doesn't change over time. Right? So we have here voltage on our uh, y-axis and time on our x-axis. And we can see that it stays a steady 1.5 volts um, you know, for all eternity until you turn the device off. Um, and so multimeters are great for reading that. Um, but that's kind of boring. If it never changes over time, then it's, it's not really very interesting. Um, what gets more interesting is when you have voltages that change over time. Um, and you know these could change um, in a repeating kind of rhythmic pattern, uh, or they could just be you know, random fluctuations, what have you. So you need a different tool to see voltages as they change over time. And that's where an oscilloscope comes in. Um, and these basically show voltage uh, over time. So you can see the voltage on the y-axis, and time again is on the x-axis. And on the left-hand side here, we have uh, a sine wave. It's following a sinusoidal pattern. And on the right, we have a square wave, because it looks like a square. So uh, they're pretty aptly named. Um, now, these are useful if you're only looking at one particular signal. right? So if you only have like one sine wave uh, on a particular point in the board, um, you know, these are great for looking at that. But what if you have multiple signals at the same point all at once? For example, if you had multiple transmitters, uh, or multiple, uh, multiple transmitters transmitting at the same time, you have a whole bunch of signals that the oscilloscope is trying to display at once, and it just looks like a bunch of noise. And it's very difficult to distinguish each of those different signals and figure out you know, what's what. So that's where something that displays, say, the amplitude of the signal versus frequency comes into play. And this is done with a spectrum analyzer. So uh, these are usually considered a bit more esoteric, uh, than the oscilloscopes, you know, the kind of kind of fancier equipment. But uh, really, I think they're conceptually easier to understand than an oscilloscope because really everyone has kind of a basic um, uh, one of these in their car, right? Um, it's called a radio. You just tune the radio and you hear a station. So you could sit there and manually tune your radio uh, until you hear a station. You can write down, you know, how loud the station is, or you know, what, you know, how well uh, the good the reception was, and note down the frequency and keep tuning. Um, that's all a spectrum analyzer does, except it sweeps a wide range of frequencies very quickly. And it just shows you, hey, I saw a signal here, and it was this strong. I saw a signal there. It was a little weaker, and so on. So for a, an actual spectrum analyzer, you might see something like this you know, with a nice new uh, digital spectrum analyzer. Uh, but again, we see kind of like there's this kind of noise floor at the bottom, and we see a few signals popping up at different frequencies. So this can be very useful if you're trying to look at multiple signals at the same time to see where uh, they pop up in terms of frequency and how strong they are. So uh, as a practical example of reverse engineering, um, I thought we'd take a look at this uh, function generator. Uh, it's the MHS 5200A. Um, you know, it's one of these Hong Kong specials you can buy off of eBay that are really cheap for what they do. Um, and usually, when you get things from China really cheap, uh, it means that they cut corners and you're going to have bugs. Um, now, if you're not familiar with function generators, they're basically uh, there to generate those signals we just saw. Right? They can generate a sine wave. They can generate a square wave. Right, so you can say, I want a sine wave at frequency x, and it'll, it'll output a sine wave at frequency x. So uh, they're quite useful for generating test signals if you're trying to test circuits and things like that. So they're a useful bit of kit to have uh, on your bench. Now, the problem with this particular unit, uh, when I bought it, is that I told it to generate one signal. Um, and <laughs> if you look at it on a spectrum analyzer, we clearly have more than one signal present on the output. Um, and this is usually um, signifies that there's some distortion on the output of the sine wave that I told it to generate here. So that's something that uh, definitely needs to be fixed. Now, it's, you really need to note that in the real world, you'll never get a perfect signal where there's only one frequency. There's always going to be some distortion, uh, some noise in the signal. So you're never going to get anything perfect, but you should be able to get it uh, a whole lot better than this. This is not uh, a very clean signal. The other problem I found with it is if I told it to generate a square wave, it outputs something that looks like this. And you can see it's kind of square, but we have kind of these oscillations on the rising and falling portions of that square wave. Uh, and this is typically referred to as overshoot and ringing. You can see that as the signal rises, uh, it kind of shoots past where it's supposed to be, and then it kind of comes back down and oscillates a bit until it 
uh, evens out. And then it does the same thing when it drops back down again. So this, these are both problems that we need to address in this unit. So yeah, it was a cheap unit and it does some cool stuff, but you know, if it doesn't do it properly, um, it's not going to be very useful on the bench. So if we want to figure out what's causing these bugs, we need to first kind of take a look at the device. And what I like to do is just kind of kick the tires. And this is really very similar to what you do if you're reverse engineering software, right? You want to figure out what kind of um, things does this device support? What does it do? What features does it have? Uh, that, sort of, that sort of thing. So in this case, um, it has uh, two outputs. You see it has channel one and channel two. And these are independently controllable. So I can put out two totally different uh, waveforms on each of those channels. Um, you know, it's got some user input here. Obviously, it's got a, an adjustment knob. It's got some push buttons. It's got an LCD. So there's clearly going to be some sort of uh, logic in here, probably implemented in a small microcontroller, uh, in order to you know read the knob turns and push buttons and output um, something on the d LCD for us to read. Um, on the back, it's got a couple of connectors. You know, it's got power, obviously, an on-off switch, but it also has a USB connector. So you can actually hook this thing up to your PC and interface with it that way, um, which is actually quite nice. Uh, it does come with a data sheet, and you can see it's got some, uh, it kind of specifies, you know, what it does and what its limitations are. Um, so you can see if you want a sine wave, uh, my unit goes up to 25 megahertz, so I can output sine waves up to 25 megahertz in frequency. But other waveforms like square waves are limited to 6 megahertz. Um, so we can kind of start by kind of taking a bit of conjecture and saying, well, how would we implement these features? Right? And what, what technology is available to actually implement these features? Um, start off with a couple of requirements. Uh, first of all, it's, it says right on the front panel that it is a DDS uh, function generator. DDS stands for direct digital synthesis, which means they are digitally generating these uh, analog waveforms. So there's going to be some sort of digital analog conversion in there. And we have two independent channels, so they're going to have to have two digital to analog converters. Um, same with waveform control, amplitude control. Um, you know, we need to be able to control those independently, so they might have some independent circuitry for each of those. Um, there's probably going to be some analog stuff in here. It's not all digital, um, because they're probably going to have to, to filter the signal and make it look kind of pretty when it comes out. So again, we're probably going to have uh, two sections there, one for each channel. And of course, we have the user interface. So my first thought was that they would be using one of these dedicated DDS chips. Um, and these are very popular. Uh, Analog Devices is a big company that makes these. Um, and in fact, you can get chips that have dual outputs, um, and they're independently controllable. And they really would give all the features that um, you would need for this unit. So I kind of figured that I would find one of these Analog Devices DDS chips in the unit when I opened it up. Um, now, these chips um, can't run standalone. You need to control them with some sort of microcontroller. Uh, and again, uh, we're going to have some sort of microcontroller in there for reading you know, push buttons and things anyway. So we'd expect to find something there. Now, you could just throw out the DDS chip completely and use a processor to digitally generate the waveforms. Um, but you would probably need a, a much higher end processor than a small microcontroller. So I didn't really expect to find a really high end powerful microcontroller on there just for generating the DDS stuff because the, the other options for doing that are typically cheaper. As I mentioned, there's probably some digital analog conversion. Uh, there are lots of different digital analog converter chips you can get. They come in lots of different package types, but we'd expect to find uh, probably two of these in the unit. Um, again, there's going to be some analog stuff going on here, so they're probably going to have some analog filters. You can buy pre-made filters like you see here. Usually, you'll find them actually um, built on the board um, using uh, inductors and capacitors for, for filtering. So we'd expect to find some of that as well. And there's probably some amplifier um, you know, right up on the output of the cha each channel to kind of uh, boost the signal and allow it to drive um, you know, 50 ohm impedance loads, which is pretty standard for a function generator. They're usually designed to drive 50 ohm loads. So we'd expect to find some sort of analog amplifier in there as well. So let's crack the thing open. Uh, now, when I first th opened this up, 
my first impression was, wow, they wasted a lot of space in this unit. Um, but it turns out they actually have a second unit that has a second, uh, second board that goes in next to this one. Um, and that's, uh, I believe, just for higher uh, amplitude output stuff. Um, but that's, this unit didn't have that, so they just didn't populate that board in the case. Um, so we see we have this one main board here. And it's not terribly large, which is nice. Um, we can see that there are some cables going up to the front panel, uh, and that's just there for the uh, user interface stuff. Um, so we can pretty much ignore those uh, boards up on the front panel because they're just there for the push button switches and stuff like that. Probably not what we're interested in. Um, we can see the rear panel connectors here. Uh, there's the, um, you can see the uh, switch there connected to the board through those uh, red and black cables. Um, and taking a look at the top of the board here, we've got uh, a whole bunch of components, uh, especially up towards the right hand side. Uh, it gets much more densely populated up there than it is on the left hand side. But on the bottom of the board, uh, we have a couple of vias and a couple of traces here, but there's no components. So that suggests this is a pretty simple board, and it's probably only a two-layer board. Um, you know, it's, it, it seems simple enough that they probably only have two layers, which is really nice because there's no hidden layers we can't see visually. Um, so if you start breaking this board down into different sections, um, this is the power supply section here. Obviously, you have the power plug there on the top right. Um, you also have these silver things here, which are uh, capacitors. Uh, you have the, the little white plug with the two prongs that goes to the power switch that we saw on the rear panel. Um, if we also look at some of these uh, ICs we have, we have this little three terminal uh, integrated circuit here. It's labeled BT151. Uh, if you Google that, it's a thyristor. And these are typically used for turning on and off um, uh, power switches and things like that. So that's probably what it's being used for here. And if you look at the second chip, it's a XL Semi chip. It's labeled XL6007EL. And that is a DC to DC converter. And these are very useful for um, either boosting your voltage up to a higher level or dropping it down to a lower level as your circuit requires. So they're probably taking the input voltage and boosting it up or dropping it down in order to run their microcontroller or whatever else they have on the board. Now right next to that is a USB connector. Uh, you can kind of see it in the bottom right hand uh, corner of the shot here. Um, and what's interesting is you can see some traces going from the USB connector to this chip uh, that's labeled CH340G. And again, you take that CH340G, Google it, and you find that it is a USB to serial converter chip. So they probably have some serial interface that's going to a microcontroller, uh, and this is just converting it to USB to talk to your PC. So when you plug this thing into your PC, it actually shows up as a USB serial adapter. The other thing we have in the back that we haven't really talked about yet is this, uh, this other plug, and it is the TTL output. TTL standard for transistor, transistor logic. Um, and it's just kind of there for, uh, to provide some digital outputs um, that you can control. Again, you can control the frequency of those outputs and things like that. So that can be useful um, for other things that you might be testing. Um, and those traces going from that uh, connector, uh, and I don't have the full thing in this slide because it was kind of a long trace and it's hard to get a good shot of the whole thing. But they actually go up to this uh, other chip here, which is a 74 ahc 14 d uh, Again, Google that, comes up with the data sheet. It is a Schmidt trigger. And if you're not familiar with Schmidt triggers, uh, most likely it's being used here to provide some nice clean uh, digital outputs. Uh, and it's probably basically being used as a cleanup filter to make sure they remove any noise from those digital outputs. Um, so none of that's terribly interesting. I mean, the USB thing's kind of interesting, but you, know, you can read the data sheet to, to realize that they had USB on there. Um, what's more interesting is these other chips that are kind of in the center of the board. Uh, we can see here the um, little white connectors. Uh, they go off to the front panel controls, and you can see that they have some traces going from some of those white connectors to this smaller chip here, labeled STM8S00. Uh, 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 again, if you Google that, it comes up uh, as a um, ST microcontroller. And it's a little 8-bit uh, microcontroller. And this isn't really a very powerful chip, so 
you know, it's probably not doing the direct digital synthesis of the waveforms, um, but it is most likely handling things like user interface stuff. We can see it does have a UART, which is serial output, so it's probably also doing the serial communications over USB as well. Now, uh, one of the interesting things from this data sheet is that it has a debug pin. Uh, and it's a single wire debug pin, and the data sheet tells us that it is this pin here that's been circled in red. So if you wanted to do some interfacing to the chip, assuming that they didn't uh, disable this debug feature, you could actually you know, hook up to that pin and debug it as specified in the data sheet, which can be very nice. Um, however, um, I want to move on to this other larger chip in the top half of this uh, picture. You can see that there's some traces, in fact, several traces, going from the microcontroller up to this larger chip. And that larger chip is a Lattice chip. Was, the company name is Lattice. It's uh, an LCM X02. Uh, if, you're, if you're familiar at all with Lattice, you know that they make FPGAs. So this is, in fact, an FPGA. Um, now, there's only really one reason I can think that they would have an FPGA on this chip. And that's, you know, FPGAs are usually used when you can't get the processing power you need out of your microcontroller. Uh, or maybe it's just, you know, uh, cost prohibitive to do so. Um, the only reason I can think of that they're using uh, an FPGA for is for actually doing that digital synthesis of the waveforms. Um, so again, I, we haven't seen one of those analog devices, dedicated DDS chips on the board yet. So this is a pretty solid hypothesis. Um, so this FPGA is most likely the thing responsible for doing the generation of the waveforms. Um, and if you wanted to, we can see these traces going from the microcontroller to the FPGA. So we can sniff those and actually see what data is sending the FPGA. Uh, in fact, the microcontroller uh, is typically responsible for programming the FPGA on boot up. They usually have to be programmed uh, every time the device boots up. So you could actually sniff all of that data off those buses if you were so inclined. Um, but we want to move on and look at the um, front half of this board. Remember, this is the portion of the board that's kind of more densely populated. Um, and this is everything kind of between the FPGA and the outputs on the front panel. Uh, you'll see that there's a couple of uh, integrated circuits here. There's four of them, actually. Um, there are two labeled LM358. Um, and if you Google that, you'll find that it is a amplifier. In fact, it's a dual amplifier. It has, has two amplifiers inside of it. Um, and if you look at the data sheet, its specified bandwidth is only 1 megahertz. Now, we know that this unit can output signals up to 25 megahertz. So they're using these chips for something on the board, but they're not directly processing the output signal. They, they can't be. They, they can't handle signals um, up at that frequency. So um, not sure what they're using this for yet, uh, but that's interesting. Um, the other two chips are both labeled AD603. These are made by analog devices. And they are variable gain amplifiers. Um, they do have a nice wide bandwidth, uh, up to 90 megahertz, uh, depending on, on how you configure them. Um, and so this is most likely used to control the amplitude of the waveforms. Because that is something you can control from the front panel. You can say, oh, I want you know, the amplitude to be 5 volts peak to peak, or you know, 1 volt peak to peak. So this is most likely directly processing the output signal and controlling the amplitude. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is that there's a heat sink here. And heat sinks usually mean that you have something generating lots of power, or dissipating a lot of power, rather. Um, and this is actually close up to the outputs of the front panel. In fact, in the top here, you can kind of see that little white thing with two pins coming out of it is the BNC connector for the channel 1 output. So if we take the heat sink off, we find a pair of these AD812 chips. Um, and they are, um, again, uh, dual amplifiers. However, unlike the LM358 dual amplifiers we saw before, these have a higher bandwidth. Uh, they can go up to, um, uh, let's see, well, gain flatness to 40 megahertz. They can actually go uh, up to a 145 megahertz here if you look at the uh, high speed rating. So these are most likely being used as a uh, final amplifier to drive the output. Um, they certainly uh, are almost certainly being used to uh, manipulate the output signal in some way. So um, that's all pretty interesting. Uh, there's also a couple other things on the front uh, of this board. For example, you have these big orange blocks. 
If you've ever dealt with electronics, you probably recognize these as relays. Uh, if you don't, you can Google the part number uh, and you find that it is a 5 volt relay. Um, now, what's really interesting is we find a pair of all of these. We have a pair of LM358s. We have a pair of 8603s. We have a pair of 8812s underneath the heatsink there. And we have a pair of these relays. And if you kind of look at this board, it's really very symmetrical. There, there are some differences here and there. But for the most part, uh, they look almost identical. They're mirror images of each other. Uh, and we have two output channels. So most likely, uh, the left half is for channel 2, and the right half is for channel 1, and otherwise they are identical in nature. So if we want to reverse engineer the output here, um, we only have to reverse engineer half of it. Right? We, we can reverse engineer channel 1, and channel 2 is just going to be an identical copy. So I decided to reverse engineer channel 1. And you know, basically I did this because I figured if any of these waveforms are getting distorted, which we know they are, it's probably happening after the digital stuff. It's probably happening somewhere in the analog processing, which is going to be after the FPGA. So um, if you look at the output of the FPGA, it goes into these resistors. And these resistors are all coded. You can look up the codes and find their values. But what's really interesting is that we have these eight pairs of resistors. And we can just look at these uh, traces and see how they're connected together uh, and draw out a schematic like this. Uh, and you can see that we have uh, eight different uh, connections coming from the FPGA into this uh, kind of looks like a ladder of resistors. And this is, in fact, a very common configuration for a digital to analog converter. You can actually um, build a digital to analog converter using these resistors. Uh, it's called an R2R resistor ladder uh, because again it kind of looks like the configuration looks kind of like a ladder. Um, so instead of having a dedicated chip they're actually using these discrete um, resistors to do the digital to analog conversion which is kind of interesting. Um, now the output from that goes to this stuff. And we can see that there's there's some capacitors here just because you can, they're kind of tan in nature and those are usually capacitors. There's also um, the black um, components there are inductors. Um, and we can tell they're inductors instead of resistors because uh, they don't have any numbers labeled on them like a resistor would. And also not shown in the screenshot, they have kind of some L markings uh, typical of inductors off to the, to the side there. Now, if you look at the traces, you can see that these top capacitors that are kind of uh, highlighted in blue here are all connected in series. Right? One connects to the other, which connects to the third, and then you have your output. However, uh, those inductors are all actually wired in parallel, which is each of those three capacitors. And then you have four more capacitors down here on the bottom, which are going from those junctions to ground. So if we draw this out in a schematic form, uh, schematic is laid out exactly as it is in physical form. We have those three capacitors up top, uh, three inductors, and then those four capacitors going to ground. Um, now, if you are familiar with electronics, you probably recognize this as a filter. Uh, in fact, it is a low-pass filter, and this is very commonly used um, with these DDS, you know, digital generation uh, uh, chips, because they have a lot of digital noise in them, and you want to filter that out. Um, and the way a low-pass filter does this is that digital noise is usually higher in frequency than the desired output signal. So a low-pass filter does exactly as the name implies. It allows low frequencies to pass through uh, without any problems. But as you get up higher into frequency, it starts attenuating those signals and dropping their amplitude down more and more. Uh, and so if you look at the response uh, output of a low-pass filter over frequency, you'll see something like this where you know, low frequencies over on the left-hand side uh, are passed through without any kind of attenuation, and higher frequencies start getting cut off. Now, specifically, this is an elliptic filter. I won't go into too many details here. Uh, however, um, that's actually important for fixing some of the problems uh, that this uh, unit has, as we'll see later on. Now, turning our attention to some of those integrated circuits, um, we can see that the 8603, which is our variable gain amplifier, actually has a trace coming from it that kind of disappears under the LM358, which was a little amplifier chip. 
Now, we don't know where that trace goes. It could connect to a pin on the LM358. It could pop out uh, on the other side as a via. Um, so if we flip the board over, we can see that there's no vias underneath the spot where the LM358 is. So it probably connects to a pin, one of the pins, on that LM358. And we can do a simple continuity test, and we find that that pin on the 8603s, in fact, it's pin 1, is connected to pin 1 on the LM358. And if we look in the data sheets, pin 1 on the LM358 is an output pin, and pin 1 on the uh, 8603 is an input pin. Specifically, it's the gain control pin. So depending on what voltage you put on that pin, that controls the uh, gain of this variable gain amplifier. So the LM358 is being used to drive the gain pin on the 8603. So using these continuity tests can be very useful to figure out how different chips interact with each other. Uh, however, sometimes you run into situations where you're tracing out a signal with your continuity tester and suddenly the trace disappears into a via. Um, now in this case we only have a dual layer board so it's pretty easy to flip over and look at the bottom and see where that via comes out. But sometimes you have lots of vias right next to each other and when you flip the board over it can kind of be difficult to tell which via it is you're interested in. So if you have some small gauge wire you can usually stick it through the via. That way when you flip the board over you can easily see which via uh, on the bottom is the one you're interested in. Now here we can see this via pops out and only is connected to this short trace which goes to another via which pops out again on the other side, so we're back on the top side of the board. So these two traces here are connected together with that via on the bottom side of the board. And this was done because there's clearly a trace going from R26 to somewhere else um, that prevents them from making that connection on the top side of the board. So you see this very often where the bottom side of the board is just used to kind of jumper over existing traces on the top side of the board. Um, now, one interesting thing when I was doing this, and you know, I know better, but I still got caught by it, is problems with doing continuity tests. So I wasn't looking at the multimeter when I was doing my continuity tests in this section. <coughs> and I was just listening for the beeps. And so I was just kind of beeping out traces and not really paying attention to whether it made sense or not. And if you do a continuity test to get across this particular resistor, the continuity tester will beep and it will tell you that these points are directly connected. Well, they're clearly not, right? There's something in between these two points. They're not just connected with copper. They have a resistor there. But the resistance is small enough in this case that the continuity tester thought that they were directly connected. So after I kind of like hastily sketched out the schematic based on the beeps, uh, I kind of looked at it and said, oh, that doesn't really make sense. Um, so I went back and took a closer look at the multimeter when it was you know, beeping at me, and sure enough, it says you know, this is about 60 ohms of resistance here. So that's just something to be wary of. You know, don't always just trust the beeps. Look at the actual multimeter. You know, it'll actually tell you what the resistance is. But you changed it, change it to measure of resistance, right? No, no, it'll it, most multimeters uh, will show you the resistance when they're in continuity mode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you, yeah, you could just put it in uh, resistance mode, right, and just measure resistance. Right, uh, but but in continuity mode, they will usually tell you the resistance that's being measured while they're beeping. So, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, none of these uh, things that we've done are particularly difficult, right? And it's pretty much looking at the board, uh, beeping out connections, uh, following vias, you know, um, looking at data sheets for chips and figuring out how they're connected, um, and you know, you write all this down, you can turn it into a schematic. So this is a schematic for the whole front end of channel one, uh, everything from the FPGA up to the output. Um, and, you know, this might look a little complicated if you're not familiar with schematic diagrams, but it's really not too bad. And it actually gives us a, a really good overview of how things are connected when we kind of break it down into a block diagram, where we just have you know, kind of show the functional components instead of all the details in the schematic. So we obviously have our microcontroller on the far left connected to the FPGA, which is connected to the digital to analog converter. That drives a low pass filter, um, which then drives a couple stages of amplification, including that 8603 that we see uh, there in the middle, um, which is the variable gain amplifier.
So we're actually at a really good spot here where we kind of understand how everything's connected together so we can actually start bug hunting. Um, so what we want to do is actually tell this thing to generate a sine wave. Now we know the sine wave is not what we want. It's got a bunch of different you know, uh, frequencies in it instead of just the one sine wave frequency. So we can have it generate the sine wave and start probing this thing with an oscilloscope uh, or a spectrum analyzer, although oscilloscope is a little more um, convenient in this case. Um, so we can start probing at the output of the DAC and say, well, you know, I don't really see any real problems there. It looks OK. Um, start probing at the output of the low pass filter. OK, yeah, it looks like the low pass filter took out some of that high frequency noise and the signal looks good. Um, look at the output of the first amplifier. Hey, that looks good too. Look at the output of the variable gain amplifier. Hey, that looks good too. Look at the output of the final amplifier driving the output. <laughs> Uh, and that's where the signal gets messed up. So clearly the problem is with that final amplification stage. Um, same thing with those uh, ringing and overshoot we saw on the square wave. Have the unit generate a square wave and start probing at the different outputs. Um, you know, output of the DAC looks reasonable, uh, but as soon as it passed through that low pass filter, suddenly we start seeing that overshoot and ringing on the square wave. So clearly there's something going on with the low pass filter that is uh, causing those issues. <coughs> so, uh, actually fixing these problems uh, requires a little more understanding of, um, you know, kind of analog electronics and stuff like that. So I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but the fixes actually ended up being pretty simple. Um, the 8812, which is that final amplifier stage that was causing problems with the sine wave output, you know, if you read the data sheet, it really wasn't meant for doing what they were doing with it. Um, and I found a pin compatible chip made by Texas Instruments, the THS3092, that was much better suited to this particular application. Um, so I simply desoldered the AD812 and soldered in one of these TI chips. And you can see here on the bottom, I've replaced the AD812 in channel one with the TI chip, uh, and the uh, top there, channel two, still has the original AD812. And we can see a significant difference in the uh, dis harmonic distortion here, which is uh, what we're seeing here is called, um, the top left here is the original output uh, with the 8812, and the bottom right is the output with the new TI chip. Now again, there's still some unwanted signals there, right? and that means that there's still some unwanted distortion, but it looks much, much better, and in fact, it's actually within the manufacturer's own specifications. Um, they, they did not meet their own specifications um, with the 8812, but with this replacement TI chip, uh, it's actually within their, their unit specifications. So uh, that's certainly acceptable. Um, the problem with the filter causing square wave issues uh, is that um, you usually have a trade-off when you're building these filters. And it's typically a trade-off between uh, how quickly the filter can cut off frequencies, right? How steep its response is, um, and to how much it actually modifies um, the waveforms going through it. So without getting too much into that, uh, there is some nice write-ups on this, um, like this one by Stanford Research Systems, who says, hey, um, <laughs> these elliptic filters are really good for you know, cutting off high frequencies, but they've caused very nasty overshoot, which is exactly what we're seeing. Uh, and they suggest using a Bessel filter instead. So um, Bessel filters are um, not terribly difficult to design. There's already people who've done all the hard math, and there's some design charts you can use to um, calculate the values of the inductors and capacitors that you need, uh, or the, you know, there's online tools for um, kind of doing this as well. So using this, I was able to uh, select the appropriate components uh, for a Bessel filter. Um, and replace the existing capacitors and inductors with these new values. Uh, so again, I've modified channel one here on the bottom with the new filter and left channel two with the original values. Now, what is interesting is um, if you just remove those top three capacitors from the original filter, that actually greatly improves the square wave output. Um, it's, it's not as good as with a properly designed Bessel filter, but um, it's still a lot better and it's a cheap hack um, and you know that might be good enough for your applications. Uh, but we can see here with the Bessel filter in place, uh, channel one uh, is in the yellow trace in the bottom, 
looks much, much more like a square wave than <laughs> the original output there, which is shown in channel two in green. Yeah, there's a little bit of um, distortion there, but it's, it's certainly much more improved. So um, reverse engineering a PCB back to a schematic is usually not that hard. It's just time consuming, right? You've got a lot of things you've got to probe out and you know, there's, um, it's kind of hard to get around that. There have been some automated um, attempts where people take pictures of the PCB and they do a lot of image analysis to try and figure out how things are connected. But again, that'll only work for situations where you can see all the traces. If traces disappear under a chip or they go into vias, um, you know, that can, that's something you probably have to do manually. Um, once you have a schematic, you can kind of figure out the block diagram. You know, how are all these, you know, major sections connected together? Uh, and that helps you a lot with figuring out how to debug things, um, figure out how to uh, modify them as you see fit.